Right. So, Ronnie, how are you doing? I'm good. I'm good. I'm fine. Sunday afternoon, the sun is shining and uh, cool, everything. And my, I just got some good messages from the doctors and stuff, you know, with struggling with cancer, you know, it, everything looks good at the moment. So uh, that's pretty cool. That's nice. And speaking of that, how did your life change since the, you found out about um, your illness? Well, first of all, it, it, it was a shock for me and my family, of course, you know, I mean, I mean, it wasn't really unexpected because I've been a heavy smoker, you know, for, I mean, since I was 10 years old, you know, and uh, had my share of booze as well. And, uh, but I actually quit smoking when I had already quit smoking when I was diagnosed with cancer, but um, well, it changed my life, you know, for a long time. I went through a lot of uh, radiation and chemo and all the treatments and stuff like that. And actually I had immune therapy until like uh, half a year ago or something. So it, it's changed in many ways because, and then Corona, uh, COVID-19 on top, you know, I mean, um, I haven't been able to, to do much, haven't been able to tour or anything. Of course, I lost some lung capacity and um, that's what I'm going to go out and check out pretty soon, you know, uh, where am I? I mean, I can still sing, but of course there, there's, a, there's a difference. I can feel there's a difference, you know, I've got to pace myself a little bit, I guess. But um, yeah, yeah. I mean, I had my music. I wrote my my songs and did two albums. You know, that's my that was my uh, therapy out of all this. You know, yeah. So um, despite all of it, you are putting your energy into music. Um, make it sound as your second solo album. Um, how did you go about uh, writing and getting those songs for it? Well, I just I just wrote a lot when I got sick, you know, and I, I wrote I bought myself a little upright piano and I used to have a keyboard and stuff like that. So I started writing on that actually for the first album. And and then when I realized after I've been coughing for three months after the surgery and the radiation, then I realized that my my voice was still still there, you know, and then I started uh I just wrote, you know, as some kind of therapy towards myself, you know, to do something positive and, and sit, instead of just sitting feeling sorry for myself. But um, so that, 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 I guess you could say music kind of saved my life again, you know. <laughs> That's, I always say it's the best healer. It is, it is. I mean, to me it is. You know? it, it is a good way of the, just the, the capability, you know, of singing, even though, I mean, if I'm alone at home, you know, I'm, I'm, if I'm happy, I sing. If I'm sad, I sing, you know, then it's a minor thing, you know, but, but it's a, it's a, a fan, fantastic thing to, you know, to have and be able to do uh, to me. Now, only a, a year ago, almost exactly uh, a year ago, you released your first solo album, One Shot. Um, how did it do for you? It did great. I mean, uh, first, I mean, it was my first output as a solo artist. And of course, you're, you're a little anxious and very tense how, how, how people are going to react to this, because it was a different album than what I normally did. It was, it, was, it was built around songs, melodies, and not guitar riff oriented or stuff like that, even though there's some heavier stuff on it. But uh, now you always, I mean, uh, I, I'm still stoked about the reception it had, from, particularly from the fans. I can see that on, on the social media. You know, I had great reviews and stuff like that. So I'm, I'm really grateful for that. Mm -hmm. And that led me to do go for another one, you know, because um, what else could I do? We couldn't tour because of restrictions and stuff like that. Also, you asked me about how it is with cancer. The thing is, it's so, it's so hard planning because I have to even, if I travel to Hamburg, which is pretty close to where I live for two days, you know, I got to seek for permission through the SOS Denmark for insurance reasons, you know. I can't just get, do whatever I want. I got to seek for permission to be covered insurance wise. So that that's a, that's kind of complicated. But, um, but I got my music, as I said, you know, and I'm, I still write. I mean, uh, even though I've done two albums now, mm -hmm. so I'm still writing. You know. What would you say is the main difference between your solo work and your work uh, within Pretty Mates? Well, I think this is. Um, all, I mean, musically, I think it's a, it's a bit more melodic rock than than metal, you know. And uh, lyrically, I think it's a lot more personal. It's more reflecting, and you know, from how I perceived thing. The last two and a half years you know the way i see the world stuff like that and and doing solo album gives me the opportunity to be more personal because if i'm in a band i represent a bunch of guys you know so i can't really write too much about myself but i can when it's a solo album i don't have to argue with anyone but myself <laughs> yeah, that helps but, it um and at this point what is the status of pretty mates 
Well, the status is that we haven't, to be honest, we haven't met as a band since 2019. Mm-hmm. You know, there, there is some, uh, there's a bad chemistry. We, we just, I think we got to need to sit down, talk things out and shit like that. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, it's not that I hate anybody in the band or anything like that, but, but certain members of the band haven't spoken for three, two and a half years, you know. I've spoken to everybody, I guess, you know, but uh, I just don't think the time is right, you know, but let's see what happens in the future. and Never say never. Yeah. You know, there's, um, no, there's no plans right now. Mm-hmm. So who is involved in your solo recordings? What kind of, of band do you have around you? A lot of ex Pretty Maze members. <laughs> 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 it's, it's all in the family. It's all in the family. Yeah, but it's just Morton Zane, the keyboard player who was on, in Pretty Mates from, I think, 2009 up until 2016. Great guy, great friend and great keyboard player, great pianist, uh, piano player. I uh, got Chris Laney, of course, who produced the album, who was on, in Pretty Mates on the last al- two albums, you know, uh, the last studio album and a live album. He was in the band from 2016 and... and um, He's the guy that actually kicked my ass and said, hey, like, send me your stuff, man. Send me some songs and I'll do some demos and you can do the vocals and stuff. like that. And that's what we did, you know. So great having him around. He's my collaborator, number one in this. Um, Alan Sorensen, the, 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 the drummer that used to be a pretty mate for a couple of years lately. And, um, and then I got Pontus Ekberg, who played with uh, King Diamond and uh, the Poodles and stuff like that. Great bass player, best bass player I ever had on. I have a play, but I got to say that. And then I got a lot of different guitarists, uh, Pontus Norvain from Hammerfall, uh, and some uh, Oliver Hartman, one of my Anastasia friends, a Swedish guy from a band called Dynasty called John Burke, who's mm-hmm. playing, you know, who plays the majority of the solos on this album, actually. And there was other, there was Key Marcelo from Europe, was, you know, involved on the first album, and, you know, just a lot of friends. And and I got Linnea Wikström on uh, back in vocals. It's great having a female vocalist on my albums because it kind of gives it another dimension some, somehow, you know. Mm-hmm. She's a fantastic singer, you know. So I'm surrounded by good people who put a lot of heart, heart and soul into this, you know. But it, it, is, it is like hired guns, so to speak, more or less, you know. But I, I have to say the new album is absolutely fantastic. Every single song rocks. There's not a down moment, you know, just just great melodic rock. Um, tell me about these new songs and which tracks do you consider special? Well, I, I'm basically, you know, I about the first album, and this one too, you know, the most important thing for me, as I said, it's not so much guitar oriented or anything like that. It, it's just based on good songs. If they sound good on the piano or an acoustic guitar, you know, you've got something going and it, the, the songs stick in your head. And that, that's been the main thing, simply to get, you know, 12 good songs on the album, and I think I've, I managed to do that. Mm-hmm. I, well, I, I, mean, I haven't heard it recently, but I, I like uh, I like I like it all because it's uh, otherwise I wouldn't have released it, you know. But I think a song like the title track "Make It Count" is something special. Oh, we'll like, get to uh, that in a second. <laughs> uh, yeah, but I mean, I like uh, you know the singles. That's for now. Unsung Heroes. I love that. Rising Tide. Uh, there's a lot of you know kind of balladish pop kind mm-hmm. of song. Remain remind me. Uh, blood cries out, rocks, you know, uh, easy to leave and being left behind. I mean, uh, I yeah. love the, I love the songs. Like know. even when you uh, mention the titles, like it kind of leads me to a question: How much of your personal experience uh, is reflected in those songs? It's in some of the songs. It is, you know. I mean, at some point, I, as I said, it, it's I've been reflecting on my life, and I've been because I am in the situation I am in, mm-hmm. and. Uh, and some of it is about the experiences I had going through this. I mean, with other people as well. If you take a song like All I Ask of You on the new album, you know, it's basically about people that try to stay away from me because they know they they don't know what to say. You know, you know, the, the kind of, oh, kind yeah. of people that, yeah, yeah, and they know me for fucking ages, you know, and I still got the same sick sense of humor and stuff. I can even joke with my own disease, you know, because it is what it is and I can't change it. But that song was about them and then there is a song like fallen which is like just about all the misery uh, you know i felt i've been going through not just cancer but uh covid 19 you know for two years the world on the lockdown and stuff like that um but then again there are songs like unsung heroes that are and make it count i've got to say make it count is really personal as well mm-hmm. but but with a positive twist i think uh, Rising Tide is about the climate changes. Unsung Heroes is about uh, those who go first in line, for instance, right now in Ukraine, right? 
and but this was written, written before this war. But uh, anyway, to, uh, and all to all those, the firefighters, the nurses and the COVID-19 and stuff like that. I like to write about, you know, something, issues that kind of make sense to the ordinary human being, not being political in, in that way, but, but just write about things that make sense to me. I'm a news freak, you know, so I'm very much inspired by news and documentaries and stuff like that. Right now, it's not so fucking funny watching the news, but... Uh, no, it's not, especially when you have a war in your neighborhood. Well, it's, well, it's horrible. Absolutely, Absolutely bad. Uh, I did not expect that to happen in um, 2022. Yeah, no, nobody did, you know. Yeah. And, you know, today they, they made a missile attack. I mean, we're talking like 70 kilometers from the Polish border, you know. Which is yeah, amazing. I keep watching Polish news and... and um, yeah, pretty much. I'm updated every every few minutes. Uh, so, yeah. It's dangerous shit, man. Uh, it's really bad. But let's see. Let's go for a peaceful solution somehow. Somehow, yes. Now, we've mentioned the title song, Make It Count, um, and it is a very special song. What does that song personally mean to you? Well, it means a lot. Because, I mean, you know, the... the the idea and the chorus is actually, uh, it's a long, it's an old idea, the piano intro and stuff like that, you know, and the, and the song is just funny because it, it developed uh, a little bit weird because it started out as a, as a, as a piano ballad. And I actually kind of, and then would, which in my vision should turn into some kind of a power rock ballad in the end with some big strokes, chords, guitars and stuff like that. But, but I send it up to Chris. And Chris sent it back to me and he said, hey, listen, I've tried to experience a little bit with the beat and stuff like that, you know, so it kind of, so when I got it, uh, he knows I'm a big Abba fan and I am a big Abba fan. So we'll, is we'll, he. Get, we'll get to that. <laughs> okay. Yeah, but I mean, the, the funny thing is that, uh, so, so he sent it back to me, I know it's a little, it's a bit of Abba, but I think it's fucking cool. And I said, hey, fuck, it's great, man. I like this. I like this arrangement, you know, and, and the funny thing is that he used to work in the Polar Studios, um, years ago and he knew and we're talking about the guitar he was going to do the solo why don't we ask uh, this and this guy and oh we're going to ask this guy he's the real guy Lasse Villander who played on all other albums from Arrival and up to the last one right and he listened to the song he thought it was a good song I said yeah I'll, I'll play on that you know so so for me I got that one off my bucket list you know get get a real Apple musician on my album I know I mean that's that's an achievement. I'm a musician. <laughs> it, is, it is for me because I'm a, I'm a huge Abba fan. Oh, well, so am I. I mean, I had Abba songs playing on my wedding <laughs> extensively. Yeah, who who doesn't like that? I mean, it's so I know. Pop, pop music written in the seventies. Yeah, absolutely. You know? Still, best melodies ever written. Best two female singers alive. Exactly. <laughs> nothing, nothing like it. Um, yeah. Now, staying on the topic of make it count, somewhere in the middle of of the song. Uh, there comes a line where you, where you say, we're all here on borrowed time. And then you kind of stop and you, in the rest of voice, you mention, uh, yes, we are. How difficult, I mean, to me, that's kind of like a very crucial moment of the song and the album. Um, how difficult was it to admit that, that all of a sudden, hey, the mortality is, it's a ticking time? Well, it is just the way it is. That, that's, again, why I'm saying it's, it's, it's very personal, you know, because that, that's... I, I did the same thing on on on, on the first album actually on, on the title track one shot is kind of about the same thing you know of course obviously make it count and one shot is about hey we got to live in the moment you know because mm -hmm. we never know when life takes a, a strange direction you know and that could be a, a serious illness life threatening disease or it could be war you know so so my 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 message is simply hey man we, we should be happy every day we open our eyes you know and uh, but it's it's not been a problem for me to sing about it, even though it's personal and it was about illness and stuff like that, yeah. uh, because it was my way of my kind of instead of talking to a psychologist that this is how I got my feelings out, and my emotions out, and, and now it's out in the open. It's out on yeah through my songs, you know, and um, it's just the way it is. Um, also, that particular song has big potential to become a head beyond the hard rock spectrum, beyond the heavy metal spectrum, uh, kind of like the way um, Europe had with Final Countdown, where you would hear that songs at, at the discos, you know, because it was that popular or, or Kisses, I Was Made For Loving You. Mm -hmm. So yeah, but I mean, uh, but I love those songs. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, do I. <laughs> the, the difference is that. But, but do you see the hit potential there? Is is there is there something in place as the song is being promoted to to push it to that level? 
I, I think it's, it's basically just, I mean, if this was out in the 80s or something like that, mm -hmm. it would have been different. And I was 25, you know, now I'm 57. You know, that's just the way it is. I'm an old fart. And these days, you would never listen to that song on Danish radio. I think it's got to be played on radio stations. Of course it is, you know, rock stations and stuff like that, you know, but it won't be a major hit, even though I think uh, it has the potential as well, to be honest with you, not to mm -hmm. sound cocky or anything, but, but, uh, but I do. Uh, but it's just the way it is. I mean, everything you hear on the radio here in Denmark is this, it sounds totally the same. It's all this urban pop music, whatever you know, and that's what they play. And it's this day is if you're if you pass twenty five or thirty, I mean, no more, no major record companies want to touch you. You know, you never hear. I, I just realized there was a new Sting album or something like you know. I, I didn't know about it because I never heard it on the radio. Uh, it's just like they play the same kind of stuff. It's got to be for. for for the, for the for the kids you know and and therefore they won't even touch it because i'm 57 years old you know and i'm not on a major company you know i'm on frontiers and they've been doing a good job but you know it's not like being on sony in the old days with cbs records as it was called you know it would have been something different of course mm -hmm. but it was also different times you know it's it's tough these days mm -hmm. to get your music on the radio mm -hmm. and and generally how do you see like the record business these days especially having been an active a member of a band that was successful in the 80s and 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 how record labels operated then the 90s and now how did that change in your opinion especially uh someone who lives in in denmark which is uh you know not a major country when it comes to music no, no but denmark pretty much follows what's the trend in, in america as well. everyone else actually <laughs> yeah well that's it you know um, of course, I've, I've been there. I was there in the good times you know, when you actually sold albums, you know, you sold CDs and you sold vials and stuff like back in the 80s and beginning of the 90s. But then people start then the CD copying started. Then came the Internet and the Napster thing and everything. And today it's streaming. You know, that's you can't beat it. You can't beat it. You can either join or you can retire or whatever it's just the way it is and of course financially it's a big difference because you don't make money from, the artist doesn't really make money from streaming you know but I'm, I'm i'm still i'm doing this first of all not i'm doing this these two albums i've done these as i said as some kind of a therapy for myself and for the fun of it and that's why i create that's why i do me that's why i write music it's 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 kind of you know musical masturbation you know i'm, I'm doing it to please myself so to speak you know first of all and then i'm fortunate that people like it but you know in our category called hot rock melodic hard rock heavy metal these people these fans actually still go out and buy physical cds and vinyls you know so it could have been worse, but of course we're not talking about the same sales sales figures as we did like twenty or thirty or forty years ago. Not at all. I mean, everybody can, everybody knows that. That's why the big bands don't want to. I mean, bands like Kiss. When did they put out an album ten years ago? They don't. They don't want to bother because there's no money in it. Yeah. Well, uh, heavy metal fans, they're faithful. I mean, if they weren't, we wouldn't have this conversation. <laughs> no, no, I mean, it's, it's some of the most loyal fans you can get in the world. I mean, it absolutely is. And I still like. I mean. Even though I don't make a hell of a lot of money on, on making albums, of course I've written a lot of songs in my career, and that pays off a little here and here and then and now and then. And but but you know, where the money is is out on the road, really. You know, but and selling merchandise and stuff like that. You know, you just gotta go. You gotta roll with it. You know, otherwise you might as well retire. You know, it's just. And, just, and just speaking time. of that, are you promoting any live? I mean, will there be any live appearances to promote? Um, the two albums you did, or is that even a possibility? Yeah, as I said I'm, before, I mean, I actually just announced like four four shows for now up here in May in mm -hmm. in, uh, in in Denmark and in Sweden. You know, just to check out myself and basically with the same kind of people that plays on the album, um, just to check out myself. Where am I? Where am I today? You know, when all this happened to me in 2019, I just toured uh, for three months with Adantasia. You know, it's another project I'm doing, mm -hmm. and then I did festivals with Pretty Mate and stuff in the summer of 2019 and Adantasia, and I was on top of my game because I was in really, really good shape singing wise and stuff like that. Then this happened. So what I'm going to check out my lung capacity yeah, because it, you know one thing is being in the studio or singing back home writing. Another thing is being on stage. So this is kind of a to check out myself and people's been asking, we're gonna go out live and I say, yeah, no, let's try it. And let's I gotta try to play these songs. I never rehearsed these songs. It's all done, written, send it up to Stockholm MP3, you know, get it back and 
I never actually rehearsed these songs in a, in a as a pre-production before we went in to do them and stuff like that. So I haven't really played them before. So it's going to be interesting. So musically, what's next? I'm still writing, you know. Uh, also, I mean, you know, I've been doing this Nordic Union stuff, you know, mm -hmm. and there, there'll be a new Nordic Union album later this year. Um, working on that. And now I have this live thing coming. I might do some shows with Avantasia again this year, but, but as I said, I cannot plan. I can't plan way too long out in the future. I mean, it's, uh, I go to scans every third month, and and um, <laughs> that's very crucial every time I turn up. You know, as I said, just that good news. But I mean, on the other hand, I can't sit down and and, and wait to die, you know, uh, or have a setback or anything. Like, I got to move, man. I got I got to move on. And well, and, you come across sounding like a, a person full of life. That's for sure. I am, I am a person full of life, and I still yeah. want. I still. I mean, I refuse to give in. I mean, unless I get really, really fucking sick, you know. But so yeah. I'm writing. I'm still writing. I plan to do more music. Uh, absolutely. So finally, when you look back at all the things you've done, what are some personal highlights throughout your career? There's a lot of highlights. Uh, talking pretty mates. Uh, I'd say like the good old 80s you know i mean we played the monsters of rock in 87 uh, the first uh, first time in japan all the big festivals we've played all the we played a lot of great gigs and in particular i think the last one well, pretty much did since 2010 up until the last album 2019 we kept a really good really high level we've got the desire back to mm -hmm. write good songs and stuff like that i'm proud of that and then i'm very proud on on, on my of my own album and particularly when the first album came out so I said I was stoked about the reception it had so and that was a, a, a very big highlight from also all the sweet messages and all the love I had from the social media from the fans because these days you can t interact with the fans directly right yeah. and I was surprised by that but also not just about the music but also the fact that they knew I was sick because I've been pretty open about it mm -hmm. and uh, and all the every all the stuff I had in return from them you know has meant a lot to me one thing which I always found surprising, I found out that early on in your career with Pretty Mates, you actually opened up for Black Sabbath on Born Again Tour. So I'm thinking, how in the world a band barely known gets to open up for such giants? What was that experience like? Well, we, we had... And how we had did it even happen? <laughs> yeah, but that was pretty surreal. I mean, uh, this was 83, right? And, yeah. Uh, and uh, we, we played in August '83 with Sabbath, and we we all I think we played two gigs before that ever, local club, and once in, in a, on a, on with some friends, uh, a half band, rock band called Overdrive from Sweden. That was it, I think, two or three gigs. And then we had a good friend in, in Copenhagen who also used to be the manager for Merciful Fate, and King, you know, King Diamond, and and he was our manager at the time, and he, and he knew Eric Thompson, who was the big guy uh, here in Denmark, getting all the bands. Uh, the hot metal bands come coming to Denmark. You know, it's a big, big promoter here, and he knew him, and uh, he and he suggested we should open up for Black Sabbath. I don't know how they found out, but we should. But then he called me and, and hey, are you sitting down? I said, no, I'm not, but I can. Said, Why? Yeah, I just pulled Terry. You can open up. You've got five gigs in Scandinavia to open up for Black Sabbath. And for me, I, I'm a huge Black Sabbath fan, you know, particularly of the Aussie years, you know. But uh, and I was a big uh, Purple fan too, so I mean. For all of us, it was wow. You know, so I've I've never been that nervous in my life. I think when I entered the stage in Oslo, uh, on the first gig, you know, it was uh, four five thousand people on Big Ice Stadium. You know, it was crazy. And uh, what was it like to interact with your idols at that time? It was cool. I mean, we we were young and naive, and we were a little kind of scared of them. It was because it, it, it was surreal. You know, it was surreal being there. But actually. Super nice guys, you know. I spoke with Tony Iommi and Ian Gill and Giza Butler, and we were kids, man. We were 17, 18 years old or something like that. But actually, as a matter of fact, Ian Gill actually helped us later in our career, suggesting to Tony Wilton, a, a producer for the BBC in England. So when we came to tour there later that year, doing a clock tour, he, had, he got us on the BBC Friday Night Rock show, which was a big thing back in 83. So, you know, it was cool, man. It, it was, but it was surreal, suddenly, it was like we 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 uh, we skipped a couple of steps, you know. We just got into the big, big stages pretty soon, you know. And then later on, we toured with uh, Purple and Saxon, all kind of bands, you know. Rainbow Priest, we opened up for them as well. So it was great.
But I, the, 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 the thing is that, in general, I'd say, I mean, all the people I met, I mean, they're, 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 they're basically just human beings, but most of them has always been super cool, you know, very nice, very nice guys. Sounds good. Well, thank you. You're welcome, man. Did you get everything you want? <laughs>